Spawn Park is supported by Gina's Spa. This summer, Gina's Spa invites you to rejuvenate and relax. Serving Waterloo Region for over 50 years, Gina Spa provides a full range of beauty, relaxation, and medi spa services. Currently Kitchener Waterloo's top award-winning spa, Gina's state-of-the-art facility provides hospital-level cleanliness. They offer the most advanced spa treatments and products for effective medical-grade results. Gina's incorporates modern advancements with traditional holistic approaches to merge beauty and wellness. In their bright, spacious hair salon, Gina's technical experts will help you achieve your hair goals while prioritizing your hair's health. Their hair designers' enthusiastic pursuit of the latest techniques and use of revolutionary products translates into personalized, fashionable hairstyles that will leave you feeling your most confident. Gina's Spa is a sanctuary conveniently located in the center of Uptown Waterloo at 6 Regina Street North. You can book an appointment online at ginaspa.com or call 519-886-2090. You deserve to look and feel your best. Trust Gina's. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome, Welcome to, to Bond, Bond Park. Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. Welcome to Bond Park. <laughs> Welcome to Bond Park. I'm Sarah Geidlinger. And I'm Marshall Ward. And today we have Adam Schwartzentruber. Adam is the founder of Boco, a design build studio and workshop in New Hamburg, where he works with his wife, Stephanie Butari. And we love Stephanie Butari. Yeah, we sure do. Adam's been involved in some really cool experimental art installations around town, including that Volkswagen Beetle that was hanging from the ceiling at Settlement Co. He even brought us 3D printed ornaments as a surprise. And he's a really cool guy. Here he is, Adam Schwartzentruber. Adam Schwartzentruber, welcome to Bond Park. Oh, thank you. We're so excited to have you here. I'm excited to be here. We usually open up the podcast talking about how we met the person, but we've just met you for the first time tonight. I was going to say, we just met. We just I met. I walked in your front door. Yeah, you did. It was great. I love how you felt comfortable. Um, your wife, Stephanie Butari, has been on the show already. Right. And um, you walked in with presents. So already we're best friends. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I really appreciate that. Adam came in with these beautiful 3D printed snowflake ornaments for us for Christmas time and they are lovely so thank you so much you're so welcome <laughs> so I think that's our first gift oh no wait we had an empanada from Vanessa Stankowitz yes yes yeah yeah but this was much more long-lasting exactly yeah. no the empanada did not last long yeah no, what's okay. great about Christmas ornaments too is uh you think of those people every time you pull them out oh always yeah. yeah so true mm -hmm. yeah and there's something about with the passage of time is that the more years march on, it could be like a teacher who gave yeah. it to you from years on. Yeah. And uh, anyways, it can really awaken long dormant memories when you pull those out. Yeah, that's Because really you don't point. really think of them all year long. You don't. Yeah. No. Um, so Adam, you are the owner, operator, sole brainiac behind Boco Designs. Correct. Right? Yeah. So we, we actually just call it Boco. Oh, well, but okay. on the web, it's, yeah, typically it's coming across as Boco Designs. Boco yeah. Designs. Yeah. Where'd that name come from? Um, so Boco was just nothing. It, it meant nothing to me. It was a sort of simple thing that we could remember. Um, the idea of when I started the business was that anybody could get behind it. Anybody mm -hmm. could be a part of it. Um, and I came from, I don't know if Steph told you much about me, but mm -hmm. I came back come from an architecture background. So oh. all the firms, uh, either are named after people's last names, mm -hmm. um, or they're named after some bag concept or idea behind their work and so I wanted to steer away from that that was really like my conscientious like objector sort of portion of me mm -hmm. said let's name it Boco it's generic it doesn't mean anything people can get and be a part of it without them thinking that it's my thing mm -hmm. that's a really great point that was kind of my goal it doesn't always work that way because people still want to have ownership of the thing mm -hmm. so that I'm starting to cross that now where I'm wanting to onboard people but they kind of want to do their own thing still, you know? Mm -hmm. So they, they want to create their own brand. They want to create something for themselves or, or something that's more emblematic of themselves. I don't so want to get too off track, but getting. do you think that that's a lost art? Like like almost um, sort of starting from the ground up or apprenticing with someone or, or bringing, you know, maybe like-minded ideas 
with another person that's a creator and spending those years honing that craft is almost missing. It's almost like the branding is coming first and the skills coming second. Yeah, yeah. that's true, actually, in a lot of places. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've kind of felt that, too. Um, what do you do? Yeah, because to me, it me seems like the time. something that I really want to do. And I've just realized yeah, it when I come. looked at your Instagram feed. <laughs> I'm like, oh, that's what I want to do with my life. But I have no idea. But how. see, you're, you're, to me, you're already Boko, you know? Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so tell um, us. Tell us. Yeah. So I do from from the beginning, it was everything and anything was my kind of basic premise. Um, I started in doing graphic design, video, stuff like that, whatever kind of came in the door and then furniture. Um, so literally like kind of all over the place. Mm -hmm. And then as the years went by, I just kind of, sorry, I'm still getting used to hearing myself. In this it's thing. weird, right? <laughs> yeah, I it know. is super weird. Me and Marshall are obsessed with it. Actually, we'll sit for a while when we're alone and just talk about things that don't matter just so we can hear ourselves yeah. talk now. Yeah, I actually yeah. feel like that would be good for me. It's fun. It's a primer. It's fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, so let me just move this forward. Yeah, I yeah, think that'll it. be more comfortable. You get comfy. Yeah. Okay. There we go. Okay. So when I started, I took on whatever I could and, um, I found this space behind a dollar store and it was basically a classified ad. I knew that I wanted to do my own thing, but I didn't know what I was going to do. And, um, I knew that I wanted to be hands-on because but you, that's what I was going to ask yeah. because you knew you wanted a space, you knew you wanted to make stuff and you knew you wanted to do it with so your own true. hands. Yeah, yeah. so okay. true. I mean, for a while I was operating out of my parents' garage. Mm -hmm. Before that I was operating out of, uh, they have a small hobby farm, so there's a barn Fun. on the property. And, and yeah, you saw these spaces of, all as art studios, like an artist studio? Um, sorry? Like an artist's studio, that's how you saw the space? Kind of. I mean, when I first saw the space that I, that I rented, um, it was just the back of house for the dollar store, so it was just storage space. Yeah. And when I saw it, it was like 1,200 square feet. So for me at that time, I was operating out of a garage. Yeah. I was like, there's so much potential here. What am mm -hmm. I going to do with this? Um, and it, the way that it is, is kind of, you guys will have to visit, but it's kind of behind um, their back of house. So it's very private. It's kind of out of the way. Is this the one you have now? Yeah, this is the one we have now. Oh, okay. This I had a drooling incident recently because I saw um, a picture of your <laughs> studio. And I think, do you, do you share a studio with Steph? Yeah. So, so I saw the, it's white. It's like, I assume if I was a Pinterest user, this would be what my pins look like, you know, it's, it's it color like organized. The there are tools hanging on the walls, um, like in succession of maybe use or size. It looks like a catalog. Yeah. Thanks. yeah it's beautiful. <laughs> I mean, that's just, it's been a slow grow. Yeah. We, we were talking about that just before we started. Um, and so like when I started, I had a battery operated tool set, you know, oh, just crazy. like a few, yeah. you know, like five tools. And I started making like benches and things. And uh, one of the first things that instigated is I took down a barn uh, north around Breslau area mm -hmm. and uh, started making furniture out of it. And so I kind of, with everything I do, I kind of do it. And then I'm like, okay, I did that. What's next? And then, yeah. And then I move on and then there's something new. Oh, I love That's it. That's kind of how it goes. That's the, amazing. Th there must be a cause and effect happening though. Like whatever you worked on now will some way influence the next piece. Yeah, totally. Yeah. Yeah. Everything seems to be in sequence. Like things get bigger, things get scarier. Yeah. Um, things become new materials. So when I f was first starting, there was some digital stuff and woodworking and then slowly we've gone into metal and slowly we've gone into fiberglass and composites and, and then the 3d printing you mentioned has always been a goal like I've had my eye on that for quite a long time mm -hmm. but then you know making it make sense to a business is more difficult you know unless you set out to just do 3d printing right work. for me I'm like I'm kind of one of everything so it's I can only pull in the tools that make sense for me at the time mm -hmm. um so as it's, much mo as it's I more want of a yeah, mad scientist laboratory <laughs> kind of yeah. yeah like if you if you visited you'd be like this is like a weird mix of mad scientist meets designer because yeah it's not chaotic. I mean, it does have chaos at times, but when you look, like you said, at the kind of like cleaned up photos of the workshop, oh. it looks really pristine, Yeah. but it doesn't look like that ever. Because so if we're you were always... to pan maybe 90 degrees or 180 no, yeah, degrees, it sure. would be quite a different story. Definitely. <laughs> what, what I love about this is I find that uh, some of the most beautiful, like minimalist art, that's so beautiful in simplicity, mm -hmm. comes out of a chaotic, you know, space that is just full of activity and i think that's totally true yeah, and yeah. Uh, i'm always amazed how, how what, what, what comes out of it can just be the most pristine clean yeah. 
um, like geometric, just amazing piece of art. I um I think I'm really excited about what you do because um, this is a side story about myself. It's all about me. Um, when I was a kid, my dad actually built airplanes. My dad built everything, but he built airplanes in our garage, and then him and his brothers would fly them out of the Breslau Airport, what? Um, which is now the Warley Region International Airport. Um, yeah, so they would have metals and uh, plastics and fiberglass and um, something I can't put my like. Uh, what are kites made out of? <laughs> you know, like some some type of material that's almost like canvas, but it's more plasticky. You okay. know, for for like um, wings and stuff like that for all these different parts. And yeah, they would build these things in our garage, and then haul them out to Breslau and fly them. Um, and my dad would build furniture and um, would just be like, "Oh, this this piece on this car is broken. Let's just you know machine one in the garage out of metal with my family or my buddy for." No reason, you know, it, it's just, it's an amazing thing. And, um, one being girls, we weren't taught that stuff. Yeah. And two, uh, he didn't live a very long life. So I wasn't able to hone those things from him. Um, but I just think I find it so exciting because I watched these men in my life make something out of nothing. And it was very exciting. Um, so I think I want to know, how did you start making stuff? Mm-hmm. Like, did you have... A family member that built things? Were you just, totally. oh, did you have, did you frame and roof? Like, how? No, so I, <laughs> I kind of briefly mentioned that I grew up on a, yeah, on hobby, a hobby farm. farm. And so, like, from the very beginning, I was making things. Yeah. I, I, like, my parents gave us, um, like, a kid's hobbyist version of a lathe table saw combo thing when we Dad were, like, lathe. when we were, like, <laughs> six. You That's know? amazing. And so we yeah. started doing things hands on at six. I think there's a picture of my brother out in the driveway with a drill him and the neighbor kid and they've got a drill and they're just drilling holes Mm -hmm. in a two by four Mm -hmm. and they're like five right and they were just unsupervised with a power tool and that's just the way it was right that's great and and i think that 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 along with my my grandfather was a woodworker Mm -hmm. and so we spent a lot of time with him and and then the forest behind my house was also another source of learning for us. We always just went out there and made whatever so we wanted. So kind of through osmosis, you would have just inherently picked up so mm-hmm. many. Yeah. And it's funny because so I, from that, you know, you get out of high school and you don't know what you want to do. So I did physics. That was the best thing that I was good at basically in high school. I was like, okay, physics is the only thing that I, lo- that I absolutely love. So I'm going to try that. And uh, got two years into UW degree and I was like, meh. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of like my projects, you yeah. know, like I do it and I'm like, eh. Like I got to the point where pretty much everything started to become completely theoretical. And I was like, now I, I still want to stay grounded. I still want to do mm-hmm. things that are grounded. And so then I took my next best, which was architecture. Um, and so then that kind of took me away from doing things by hand other than model making. Right. But that's a small part of that learning process. Model making is kind of a, it's not an everyday hands-on thing, right? Well, for architecture students, Waterloo anyways, mm-hmm. it is it is a fairly uh, repetitious thing. You do pull it back in because okay. design is, you know, as much as it is sketching and that kind of thing, you really need to understand space. And so they really encourage you to be iterative. That's and good. so we'd, we'd make a model almost every project. But um, it still wasn't quite enough. And so physics and architecture. And then at the end of my architecture degree, I started working for a professor. And the way it came about was I was basically failing the studio not quite but i was going against the grain and um, doing a project that wasn't part of the project and i was really interested at the time in robotics i was interested in architecture that moves i was interested in things that you know weren't really real in in the in a sense they were real in the sense that you could make them but nobody was making them. Um, and 3D printed buildings was one of those things that I was wow. interested in. That was back in second year, third year. And uh, at the time, Philip Beasley um, was my studio prof. And little did I know that his interests, I had no idea. So I was pursuing my own thing. And my own thing was basically a building that had a series of rooms. Um, and then the rooms would move around each other. And so the idea was, Right now we're in a triangle, right? Mm-hmm. So the idea is we're equidistant to each other. And so we can all have an equal relationship to each other physically, like from this space. So the idea was to move people around each other kind of constantly. And in such, in so doing that, we'd kind of like average the distance that you spent next to 
A, B, C, D over time. Crazy. Right? Yeah. And, and the idea was, yeah, it was really crazy. And it really, the idea there was to try to approximate uh, equality through equidistance mm-hmm. and then let the rest, the social things take care of themselves. But the idea that space could also be considered as something that we use to create equality. I, I was that. interested in that concept. Yeah. So anyways, <laughs> that was just like the primer. Um, so then I, I went to a conference actually. It was my professor encouraged me to go to this conference where we were doing algorithmic design. So we were punching numbers into the computer, creating a code, and I was watching these little little dots move around each other to try to approximate this equidistance, right? Um, I came back, and and then they were like, you need an elevator core in your building. You need stairs. You need fire exits. You need this and that. I'm like, oh, my gosh, are you serious? That's a different level of math now. (laughs) We've got the concept working now. How do we get the code happening, right? right? Exactly. Yeah. And and I wasn't a big fan of that. I was really interested in what I was passionate Mm -hmm. about. So I spent two weeks just like after school was done, giving them all the requirements so that they would pass me, right? Mm -hmm. In quote, in air quotes. You can't see me doing air quotes, but I'm doing air quotes. We'll have to announce it. Air quotes happening now. Air quotes happening. (laughs) Maybe there could be a little sound effect. (laughs) (laughs) Ding. Oh, that's better. Oh, that's way better. Anyway, so um, what was it in air quotes? Yes. So, so basically, I finished that up, and then my prof calls me and he says, "Do you have a job yet? Because it's a co-op program. We worked every other term, right?" And I was like, "No, I just spent three weeks doing a bunch of crap for you. What mm-hmm. do you mean? I don't have a job yet?" He's like, "Why don't you come work for me?" Fantastic. So I had no idea what he did. So I looked it up, and he did. Um, sculpture basically he does hmm, he would have to describe it best but essentially it's like empathetic sculpture so sculpture that is architectural empathize, empathizes with you relates to you in some way and that's kind of the and is moving and is moving I yeah. think I've seen this stuff so it's kinetic it has yeah. sensors and crazy um, sound light so I started working for him because yeah. that just made sense to me. I'm like, oh, well, this is different. This is actually really close to what I was talking about and in my studio. It's project. a lot of moving parts at once. That it kind is of a work. lot of moving parts. Yeah. yeah. He does it pri- primarily out of laser cut acrylic mm-hmm. and uh, a ton of different materials. Mylar, wow. which is like a, yep. kind of like a thin plastic. I'm familiar with Mylar. Yeah. yeah. So I started working for him. Um, we did a couple of international sculpture projects. Um, and then I came back for another co-op because it still interested me and I was learning a lot from it. So I ended up going back for two consecutive co-ops terms and I went all over the world, which is amazing. That is amazing. Yeah, it was really cool. Mm-hmm. Um, so is the term art installation being used all, all along the way here in terms of uh, how, you, how you're defining what these creations are and uh, and if they can if they're a permanent art installation or if they can move around is that is that what you're thinking about while you're making these and where their places or is it just no totally I think I'm trying to th- I mean typically he calls them sculptural installations yeah. um, he doesn't tip Philip anyways didn't use the term art I would call I would definitely say it's it's art it's sculpture it's the mix yeah, yeah. I, I like the idea of not using the word art that's interesting yeah. What kind of sorry, what would he use to sculpture. Just, sculpture. Sculptural. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Like on the I mean, typically on this website, for instance, he labels them as sculptures or mm-hmm. as architectural pieces or Yeah. I've never heard them called art pieces per se. That's kinda of interesting. Yeah. yeah. So then from working with him, obviously like Marshall's getting it, now you're now you're creating your own, yeah. right? Yeah. Is that where you the Kind of, but yeah. like so after I worked for him, I did a ton of work for him actually mm-hmm. and I was exhausted I'm like I don't want to do this anymore and I learned a lot from his studio as well his studio has a fabrication element so they have an office and then they also do the fabrication of wow. the sculpture there um, I, a lot of it anyways it sounds a lot like a, if you were like a master's student in a fine arts program going off to work with a yeah, uh, very much so an like a professor for, yeah. in, a, in and, that realm and they come back exhausted yeah you don't think of yeah yeah. You're right. And nobody even really realized what he was doing until later in school. And we started looking at his work Yeah, because he taught very pragmatic courses like on this, this one that I was supposed to be doing was an office <laughs> right. building and it was an office building with, you know, stairs and exits. Cause that's what a, like an, a master's of fine arts or an MFA students. Yeah. Um, time looks like. So when I was done, I was just exhausted. I started 
to do my own thing. And that's when I, I just got back to the hands-on skills with him. I was doing hands-on, but I was, uh, cause I was basically a lead on most of the install work, um, as well as design in-house for iterative design and that kind of thing. But, you know, I was starting from square one. I didn't have any tools. I didn't have a laser cutter. I don't have, you know, anything that he had in his studio really. So, um, I started with what I could get my hands on and started making furniture and stuff. And, and I think part of that was also, I'm like, okay, I've done a lot of interactive sculpture. You know, I can't even count the number of But can I sculptures. make a chair at this point? Or Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was more like, I just don't want to see that stuff mm-hmm. for a while, you know? Um, so then I started doing the furniture and then it's slowly kind of coming back in. So now we've done, in the last year, we've done two or three kind of interactive sculptural light and sound, but a lot of it's still pretty earthed like a lot of it's mostly static so it really varies so then starting on your own like uh, going from that experience with the professor and then starting to build things that are a little more simple and then moving on how did you immediately you know I'm doing air quotes can you make the sound (laughs) yeah yeah (laughs) how did you immediately (laughs) turn that into a business right like yeah, you I know, didn't really. I don't no, it know. takes no. time. It right? did, definitely did. Yeah. Yeah. And and it's still, I think it still wavers mm-hmm. on like fun, not yeah. a business. Yeah. But mine um, does too. I get yeah. it. Yeah. You're not Stephanie Butari. <laughs> I'm, not, I'm not. Yeah. I, I often do joke about that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. that's funny. <laughs> it's true. It's true. She's killing it. Yeah, she yeah. is. Yeah. Do, you, do you, um, is there a kind of a point where you begin to see your own, uh, I don't know if this is the right word for it, but um, style. Like I've watched how like uh, painters, for example, or sculptors uh, work, and all of a sudden you begin to recognize their work or photographers' work where you start to go, oh, that's a, a Matt McCarthy photo, who's one mm-hmm. of our guests. Um, in your type of uh, journey, is there a point where you start to go, oh, I think this is, this is me in the work here? And people will begin to see yeah, you. Yeah, totally. No, yeah. there totally is. When, do, when does that happen? It, it happens kind of on every project, but in a different way right now. Yeah. I'm very client driven. So I'm always trying to do what they want. And then I usually end up putting a little bit of a spin on it from my perspective. Um, however, I'm kind of like doing this patient game of waiting mm-hmm. and building up the workshop. Um, the way I've described it before is like, I don't quite have all the tools that I want in my head. Will you ever? That's a really good question. (laughs) We can get to that in a second. No, it's so true. Um, Will I ever? That's a really good question. I think, yes. I do. I have like five or wish list 10 10. that are in my mind right now um, that are pretty, pretty basic. But what are those tools? Sorry to talk for somebody who's interested in this kind of stuff and maybe listening and has this kind of stuff or is into, into this kind of work. What are those dream tools? Right. So, we have a lot of tools, mm-hmm. but we don't have a TIG welder yet, which is a tungsten inert gas okay. welder, which used for welding aluminum, stainless steel, that kind of thing. I um, you can still weld aluminum with a MIG welder. There's many types of welders. There's three, basically three basic core ones. Um, but for cleanliness of welding aluminum, you really need a TIG welder to do really precise, beautiful stuff. And so that's one of my, Kind of my my wants yeah and then plasma cutter as well which would allow us to cut custom shapes because it would be a cnc plasma cutter um, which means it's controlled by computer right. so it would cut out whatever shape and steel or aluminum uh, brass copper whatever and then um above and beyond that it's really just getting more 3d printing right. power so um, metal 3d printing um specifically would be would help fill that gap because we can already do plastics um and then once those once those are kind of in the air, we still need a few other things, but mm-hmm. they're smaller. They're not as significant. Big, big ticket items. So yeah. 3D printing is it? My understanding that it's like a polymer liquid. Yeah. Like so almost like it's a, in going into a jet printer, but it's instead it's a polymer, and that's what's going to make it uh, three dimensional and hard. It depends on the type of 3D printing. So there's there's kind of like a there's a few types. Um, There's FDM, which is like fused deposition. So that's basically like a hot glue gun. And the hot glue gun spits out material and Mm -hmm. builds it in layers. Then there's SLA, which is stereolithography. And so basically you'd use a resin and then you'd use a UV to cure the resin. Okay. So 
the light cures resin in la- successive layers. So the guys who are doing like you mentioned D and D before we started talking, somebody who's doing really intricate things would be using that stereolithography method where the light cures the resin and it's very, very precise because it's basically casting light. And that's, and so, sorry, that's the one that's in thin layers, then the light casts it, then another thin layer. And then, correct. Okay. And then, Whereas the FDM one, which just extrudes hot plastic or whatever you're extruding, mm-hmm. typically they're all plastics, um, basically it's like a little nozzle. And so it works around in lines and then layer by layer. Mm-hmm. So it does infill and all that stuff. Those are all terms that are associated with 3D printing. But the other one is sintering. So um, sintering is just basically a laser fusing things together. So if you have a bunch of powder on a bed and then you take a laser and you just fire it all over the place, that's going to create a sort of like spider web of things that are connected, right? You can imagine that. So basically the laser does that layer by layer again. Um, Most of them are layer by layer right now. There are a few um, professors and universities working on much more Trek kind of style 3D printers where you could basically take electricity and and emit a pattern or emit a pattern of electricity to create an object more all at once. So that's pretty not exciting. layer by layer. Yeah. So, so yeah. Uh, Star Trek. Yeah. Very, that's I'm what just I said, like yeah. computer. I want real gray hot. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. That's why I said I said I kind of said Trekkie. Like. Yeah. That's yeah. great. Oh. Um, Which sorry, can I just I just want to ask what um, f- format you used for the Snowflake ornament? So that was an FDM printer. Okay. Um, it prints in whatever you throw at it, basically. So the nozzle goes up to I can't even remember if it goes past 400, but we print pretty much at 300 degrees. So it prints a PLA, polylactic acid, basically. It's a corn-based bioplastic, bio in quote, air quotes, <laughs> <laughs> because it's not really bio yet. Yeah. Um, yeah. You have to have a, a biomass to a biomass like reducer to actually compost it, which right. not many places do. So that's like environmentally a thing that mm-hmm. we want to be conscious of. But um, it, it just lays hot plastic is what it does layer by layer. We can make crazy stuff with it. It's really cool. I bet. Sorry, Marshall, what were you going to ask? I want to ask you about uh, color, your use of color in your work. Mm Because I look through some of the images, I can see how... um, You're always very interested in color. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm fascinated by the idea that somebody can work within uh, something very incredibly minimal, like an off-white or something, and Mm -hmm. uh, and patterns and stuff. And then another piece can just have a ton of vibrant color in it. And what dictates that for you in Mm -hmm. terms of whether you go one way or the other? Um, I'm going to go with this and keep it very minimal and white or I'm going to go the other way and just looks like a beautiful, gorgeous thing. Other, otherworldly thing of color harmonies. Yeah. Interesting. I guess I always like to achieve a balance. So like, like I said, if I just forget about the client driven stuff and just think about my own work, if I were to just sit down and make something, it would, I would just try to achieve a balance between things that speak heavily to you, like in terms of uh, bright colors yeah. and things that don't. And, um, and then I always try to, or it seems that I try to put a natural element in there to kind of earth yeah, it, notice you that. Know, bring mm-hmm. it down a little bit too. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's really, again, it's kind of hard to see that because the client work drives it in a lot of ways. And then those kind of end up just being a little kind of ghosts of what happens, right? It's not Let's- clear. Let's talk a little bit about the client work because that's some of the stuff that we've seen around town. Um, we were talking a bit before we started here when you first got here about the um, disassembled old uh, VW Beetle yeah. Um, yeah. that was in the Settlement Co. coffee shop downtown Kitchener. Um, yeah. Could you talk a little bit about that piece and how that came to be and we why lovingly, and I love it? Yeah, we <laughs> lovingly called her Carol. Oh, okay. And it was because we found the original um, the original ownership oh, in the that's glove so box. Cool. Mm-hmm. And it was a lady by the name of Carol. And I can't remember her first name, or her last name. Mm-hmm. Um, but I guess this thing just sat em- some empty tarmac. I think what happened is, what the story I got was she drove to the airport, like left, and then the car never got picked up. The car just sat at the airport for like ever. Wow. Until somebody was sold it or something. Very yeah. So the ca- I know, right? Yeah. Isn't that super crazy? Yeah. We all have to, I'm going to have to go back and listen to this whole podcast. No, now that's called talking reclaimed about? art. You know? yeah. Yeah. No, it really is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so they asked us to, they literally just showed us a photo of another artist's work, which is, um, and I'm, I'm not sure the artist's name, but they took a bug 
essentially do the same thing, except they, they split it down to like the nuts, nuts and, and the bolts. bolts. Kind of thing, yeah. Yeah. And so I said, well, you know, we didn't really talk budget actually. It was crazy. They just called me. They, they called me and they said, Hey, Steph said you might be the kind of person. And I was like, sure. Why not? And then a week later, Rob Theodosio called me and he goes, yeah, we got the car. Can we drop it off? <laughs> like, uh, where? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> like tomorrow. I'm like, we're dropping it tomorrow. Is that cool? I'm like, yeah, okay, sure. And so this truck showed up and offloaded a VW Bug in front of our studio. I'm Fun. Like, we hadn't talked budget. We hadn't talked anything. And actually, we didn't even really figure that out until later. So sometimes... There's some risk involved in what I do, for mm-hmm. sure. For sure, but I think this one was worth it. It was fun, it was so right? So worth it, yeah. I personally had got a lot it of enjoyment It was worth it to this. see everybody enjoy it yeah. so much. Yeah. 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 I only went to that shop. To see it. Because somebody had told me about the car. Right. Yeah. Yeah, no, it was definitely a big part of that. So space. where did you work on it? How, how did you and where did you work on it? So we pulled, actually, I'm trying to think, did we pull anything off of it outside? We pulled garbage out of it outside. Excuse me. Um, there was a ton of stuff in it. And so we, we tried to excavate all that out. And then we literally rolled it in the studio. And the, the garage door to the studio is be below average size. So the thing just brushed Barely the sides. Through, yeah. And um, the way the studio is designed is to have a kind of like main thoroughfare because our office comes first and the workshop comes second as opposed to like a typical mm-hmm. you know office and workshop have two separate entrances. We have one entrance. So we have to use it for both. Mm-hmm. And um, we got it in and just pulled it all apart right there in the studio, what space we had. Yeah, yeah so were any of you, um, like, I've, I've known people for most of my life who work on cars, and there's a real precariousness to it. Um, sometimes there's a weakened, a weakened part or something, or something. There's a danger to it, too, right, working on them. You can get a hand crushed pretty easily if something's not. Um, did anybody have an understanding of vehicles and, and how to pull this apart? <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> No, I have never worked on a car in my life, I don't okay. think. And and I think that just came from my background. My dad didn't work on his car. My grandfather might have. Yeah. Um, my greats definitely did. I've, I've seen pictures of them mm-hmm. doing crazy things with Model Ts. Yeah. But um, I never did. And uh, part of that was just because when I was in high school, tech was kind of off the radar for me. Mm-hmm. I was really focused on getting all my sciences and my art and yeah. keeping my phys ed going. It, High school makes it hard to do all those things mm-hmm. and yeah. do tech and engineering. There was one engineering course that I was in and I loved, but automotive tech, unfortunately, just kind of gets pushed to the side mm-hmm. for people who are interested in science, which is kind of a shame. It's but a anyways, shame. that's yeah. another mm-hmm. discussion altogether. So no, yeah. we didn't. We didn't have any just experience. Went for it, yeah. We just went for it. And, you know, safety is always number one for sure when you're working on stuff like that. And we had a high school co-op at the time, so I'd just give him jobs that I, I knew he could handle. But mostly it's just dis- slow disassembly. Yeah. And once we had Off it up on... a bumper. Yeah. Exactly. And once we had it up on blocks, it was pretty easy. It's just all the pieces became lighter and lighter mm-hmm. and lighter. Yeah. What are some of the other pieces that are out there that are bigger that people can see that are in maybe public places? Yeah. That, as I was coming here, I'm like, mm-hmm. am I going to remember... What have I done? Yeah. <laughs> am I going to remember what I've done? Yeah, like, you can I open up I pulled up my media. Instagram because mm-hmm. I'm like, what have I done? Mm-hmm. But um, no, we've done a number of things around the area. Um, For All Ice Cream's tasting yeah. room was one What's of them. Um, oh, man. Like, we've done stuff in Vidyard, um, just walls, green walls, painting, um, like custom planter boxes. Mm-hmm. Really, it's, like I said, it's kind of all over the place. All over the place. Yeah. We've done a few different pop-up shops. We've yeah. done a few different uh, event booths and that kind of thing as well. I think the one so that I saw wasn't place. on your feed. Somebody had... Oh, perhaps. Yeah. Mentioned it was you? Yeah. Mm-hmm. No, we've done all kinds of things. So it's hard to know. Um, we did, last year we did a couple um, high-speed train prototypes. That what? was super fun. Yeah. <laughs> so we didn't do the, we didn't do the mechanical design, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. We couldn't get involved in that. We were, I was really wanting to, but um, it was a university-led team. And so the only thing they were able to kind of offload to us was, hey, could you build us a wicked awesome shell mm-hmm. so we did that that was really fun what well, yeah. must be so amazing is you're creating these one-of-a-kind gathering spaces mm-hmm. for people and uh i always think of it as a way that um you know whatever connection you already feel with your city that you live in and work in um these spaces give you a, even more of a connection you know when you when you're in these spaces do you yeah. um are, 
are you looking at the spaces when you when you know you're working on it? I'm going to call it permanent art installation. When I like that. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. When you look at the spaces, are are they influencing the work, or does the work kind of arrive and then you build around that? No, absolutely. Space comes pretty much primary. Yeah. Um, I don't always have enough creative freedom to make those decisions, but I try to steer people towards giving things room to breathe and room to appreciate them. Um, with the car, you know, the location was kind of set and actually it did have room to breathe. Mm -hmm. Um, and with for all ice creams tasting room, I remember we talked about just keeping the simplicity and, you know, thinking about how people enter the room and how people leave. And so it really shaped that whole little, it was a really little space, Yeah. but it shaped the, the design there for sure. I find it interesting too, how public art can land in a space and, uh, um, there can be a lot going on around it that um, is not complimentary, right? Um, like murals, for example, can have something right directly beside them that is is not um, complimentary, I'll say, to, to the art around it. And anyways, I find that really interesting. Uh, there's things you just don't have control over that's around your art. Is that right? Yeah. No, that's so true. Yeah. Yeah. And you have different constraints that you have to work. Like, I just work within the constraints that I'm given. Right. Yeah. When, when I'm just thinking now, wouldn't that be fun when the project comes up and they're like, okay, Adam, do your thing. Oh, that'd be fun. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> That'll be exciting. That'll that be happens. really great. I, I'm going to look forward to that. Um, yeah. I want to talk a little bit about your other medium. So we talked quite a bit about 3D printing, um, a little bit about welding and metal, um, a little bit about furniture making, but I know there's a lot more to it that we don't know. So, I mean you're creating something out of a giant piece of metal let's say i'm sorry metal's very generic it's steel or it's aluminum or it's something else um what how is that created what are you using what's happening there i mean so far we've really just um adopted basic techniques so we just what use a bandsaw and welder you know okay. like and a few bending tools and we don't have any of the heavy industrial machinery that mm -hmm. a typical metal fabrication shop would have so those things are kind of out of our reach and that's why the tool desire yeah, the, list exists. The list is there. Um, and now when you say something like that, like uh, these bigger, bigger shop tools, I'm, I'm immediately imagining something that can maybe like fold metals. Right. Exactly. I don't know yeah. the, what the right a terms. A press break, okay, for instance. There you yeah, go. Or a finger press. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but, yeah. So. Yeah. So something that can do bends 90 mm -hmm. degrees or less and or more um, would be ideal, but we don't have those tools. So we just work with what we have. Mm -hmm. And then we also do have access to other fabricators if we need something done that we can't do in house. I don't really like to do that. I like to do everything myself. That's the artist in you for sure. Yeah, yeah. Totally. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I guess there are things that are elusive to you. I'm just imagine. I haven't seen all your work, obviously, but I imagine something like um. I think about Jeff Kuhn's work and his uh his spherical like uh looks like it's made of a mirror type thing. Like those kind of works are those are being created with some kind of technology that's out of reach for you. Mm. Is that right? Mm. Yeah, totally. Like we don't have an English wheel. We don't have any of the, the typical things that would be used to bend sheet steel and stuff like that. Yeah. Um, and so the 3D printer kind of fills that void for now in a way because we can just watch it print whatever shape we can dream up as long as we can get it into the computer. But given the fact that we have that background, that's not, that's easy to do. Um, can you speak of collaboration and how every experience must be completely different like in terms of... Yeah, totally. Because yeah. I'm always collaborating with the client um sometimes we've had three different consecutive co-op students actually we've had like three high school co-op students which has been pretty fun and then we had one university of waterloo co-op student recently so we've learned to collaborate with them too and i'm always trying to like 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 i said from the beginning boco is supposed to be everyone mm -hmm. um and so i'm always trying to get them on an equal playing field with me and it doesn't always work like I'm trying, trying it well, that's part because of the it's part of, of it. yeah. it's part of my learning too. And mm -hmm. in, in how to collaborate with people who have experience, but they don't have the same perspectives or they have different perspectives. And so there's no need, there's well no need for an artist statement, you know, when you, when a piece arrives is, you know, like a, a graduate student may talk, yeah, for, talk I, for an hour about the piece. I get it. I mean, <laughs> I, I've seen it. And I think that coming from working for Philip, I kind of just got, that it got rid of that part of me. I don't really, it's not really something that I would want to speak to. I feel like it should, like you know, speak for itself it should or, speak yeah. for itself. I, I think the term is speak to people. Pedestrian art, right? Like it, uh, yeah. 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 Kind of. It doesn't I, require an art I got statement. a little jaded by that whole 
kind of theoretical idea, ideological thing. I mean, I was very much like that. And so, you know, working in that sculptural field and hearing the kind of talk, you know, it's a lot of talk. And so I, I understand the ideas that are trying to be expressed, but then my frustration was always, they weren't fully expressed. And so I'm like, can't we just focus on making it express those ideas instead of pretending what what i learned i've written about in the newspaper that uh bell for kepler uh, by royden robinovich in um Waterloo town square no one has a big rusty bell and you get a lot of feedback from readers and a I lot got some feedback yeah a lot of it is i don't care what it's about i, I don't like it you know what <laughs> i mean i don't like anything about it and they talk about how um you the artist can talk on and on about, you know, the state of balance in society and stuff. It says, it, it doesn't mean anything to me. And uh, that's what I find with some public art pieces that have a big artist statement that go with it, that the reaction sometimes is, I don't care. It's, it, it's about how I, how I feel and the emotions are evoked. You know, is this all about likes and encouragement? You know, are we just liking everybody's stuff and encouraging everyone? And, and that's all we're doing and we're kind of losing the, the old ways of discussion criticism and all this stuff yeah we talk a lot about that on here too about just even storytelling being lost Mm. um stories are fast and they're quick and they're over yeah where storytelling and maybe you can relate to this like growing up on a hobby farm and you've already spoken about your parents and grandparents and great-grandparents already so there was obviously some storytelling that happened in your family maybe living a little bit more of an old school life totally right yeah so without those stories like who was adam once he gets to work right right? you're just like a new person trying to make your own way with no history and no humility Right? Yeah. That's, sorry, kind of went no, off on my storytelling tangent there. No, that's yeah. fair. Oh, I think of the visual storytelling, what Sarah was saying, made me think about how, you know, we all have our unique way of mark making, you know. Yeah. Sarah scribbles on a piece of paper differently than I do. We have mm-hmm. our own kind of marks. You, there must be things that you can even see in your own childhood that are with you today in the way that you handle certain, what, either what you're attracted to. It could be color, it could be pattern, or certain marks or the way you, uh, you just handle things. There must be things that you think... I think I was doing this already back, back yeah. then. Yeah, I, I think a lot of it for me has been that I'm, when I'm working on something, it's something that I'm interested in working on. Mm-hmm. And a lot of times, for better or for worse, I avoid the things that I don't like working on. And All right. that, that's, I think that's a very typical yeah. thing that people do. And I think sometimes I take it to extremes. Yeah. <laughs> like maybe and, you should be working on it, but you're not. Oh, yeah, yeah. like 100%. <laughs> And I, and I pride myself in getting something done mm-hmm. super fast, but great. Mm-hmm. That's totally, that's, bec- that's part of my architectural training because unfortunately. 100%. That's the, that's the business model. You can be fast, good, or cheap. You can yeah, only yeah, be two. Yeah, the triangle is, you can't is be, real. Yeah, you can't just be But all. I had a lot of practice procrastinating when I was in school because I didn't want to be doing the project, right. right? And so whenever I get something that I'm not super passionate about, I end up, I'm, I'm really good at kind of fitting it into mm-hmm. the other stuff. So my shop, I have share the, share my workshop with two people. One is Stephanie and the other is, um, Adam Strauss from Strauss design. He does custom signs and crazy, really cool vintage stuff. And, uh, he's been with me for almost five years before that we had a painter and artist. And so part of the mantra of Boko is always to share it Mm -hmm. as well. Um, and he kind of says to me all the time, he's like, how do you make time to work on the workshop? Like, how do you make time to paint something white like who cares if it's white i care i really enjoyed those I know, photos i know it's so <laughs> true yeah. um and i think the way that i do that is just to push the other stuff aside and oh yeah i do stuff like that, that all the time yeah. are there mediums that you've delved into that you haven't enjoyed uh, i'll give an example of my own um i, I learned quickly i don't like working with wire <laughs> and i don't like clay and uh, are, there, are there things you've got in your hands on where you go this is not at all something that's uh for me, uh, either um, it, it doesn't feel right. It's just not your medium to work with. That's a really great question. Mm-hmm. I think the thing that comes closest to that is probably the digital mediums, only because when it's when it's physical, I can make it whatever. I feel like I can shape it into whatever. I can add clay. I can add paper. I can add yeah. any material and just make make it. But then make it sculpturally, not necessarily make it mechanically. And so that's why I always wanted to bring the digital and the, the CNC machining back into it. Because I want to like sculpt it and then I wanted to like make it do something ideally. Um, so I think digital 
to answer your question. Yeah. Have some of your projects been really arduous in terms of like just not coming together the way you were hoping and just like challenges and kind of false starts just oh, where yeah. you thought I heard talk about, you know, like to be able to work quickly if you can and just something that's just this thing is just being a huge pain and it's not at all. I think, yeah, I mean, without going into, I mean, because then it kind of exposes which client is for. But, <laughs> right. um, no, I think, yeah. You can tell us after. Yeah, yeah no. it's true. It's true. <laughs> no, I have had that. Um, maybe one or two projects where there's been one, I remember one project, one of the Hyperloop projects where we kind of signed on for it. This was for the R Loop project, the second one we did. And the time constraint was so short. So, I was initially just going to be like, no, I can't do this. Like they really wanted something from start to finish in two weeks. And Mm. we had just started doing fiberglassing and stuff. And uh, luckily my co-op student at the time was like, you know, I'm game to do long hours. I'm like, all right, well, if you're on board, then I'm on board. Because we had literally just built the CNC machine. We hadn't ever like CNC'd anything three-dimensional. And here we are doing complex curvatures and whatever. So that was like a time constraint in terms of, so that was really stressful, but we got through it. But in terms of like just false starts, I think there's only been like one or two. One was just a countertop, concrete countertop. And it, because of the nature of the project, it was for a family member. It was kind of like under budget and kind of like, you know, needed to be done quick. And so I started kind of working on it quickly. And that really quickly bit me in the butt. Mm-hmm. Down the um, wrong path? Well, it just basically meant I had to like recast the concrete okay. multiple times, you know, we were trying to accomplish something that nobody had really done, which is basically like, well, I shouldn't say nobody has done. A lot of people have done resin and concrete, but the way that we're trying to do this kind of like cantilevered clear edge to this concrete table thing was kind of unique. And so without that care and dedication and time, it, it became quickly a headache and it actually lasted a good portion of this year where it was just sitting at the shop, kind of like fitting it in between other right. projects. So yeah. that was really, I'm really glad to be done that. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. It, it makes yeah. me wonder, when you um, haven't seen a piece of yours that you created for a while and you come upon it and you see it, um, I imagine one of two things maybe happen or both. One is uh, um, it, feelings run through you when you see it. Ho- hopefully feelings of joy and pride and appreciation, almost like you're, you're seeing it with new eyes. Or maybe what it does is it triggers the memories of creating it and you find yourself just thinking more about that or maybe something that uh, that you would like to do over something all of the above like both of both of those but then also in addition to that it's like whatever i learned in that project Mm -hmm. usually comes to mind yeah um for you know for better for worse all these projects have a learning thing sometimes mistakes that get corrected or sometimes just learning how to use the cnc in a new way or something like that so whenever i see them i kind of typically think of those but every project's different yeah. like for the bw bug project really it went incredibly smooth for how ridiculous it was it was ridiculous in and such so, a good when way. I, so when <laughs> i look at it i mostly just think about the times that i had doing it and, mm-hmm. and the people that i bumped into do you have appreciation and love for your early work can you look at your earliest pieces and say um you're making the artist face he's making the artist <laughs> face yeah. am i yeah, yeah. No, <laughs> the answer is no. No really. one does. Yeah. It's I mean, part of the process. Yeah, I think that like people can get so, I know from personal experience, because I work with an artist and she, she's so self-critical, right? And, and so I don't like to look at my old stuff because I know it's my old stuff as well. And, and I'm always just like looking for what's coming next. Mm-hmm. And if I do happen to see something that I made a while ago, I'm just like, ah. That was cute. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually a really like, um, respectful way of looking back on it. One of my favorite questions to ask, I've got to interview some uh, rock stars over the years. Mm-hmm. So then I remember asking uh, Neil Pert of Rush what he, th- what he hears when he hears those early Rush records. And he said, I think about how naive we were. You know? Right, he, exactly. He, he hears the lyrics and stuff and he talks about how, but he has a lot of love for those young lads that he hears. Or uh, Ann Wilson of Heart has talked about, I remember asked the same question. She said, I can hear how I didn't have any restraint. I just belted out my singing and how it took time to find restraint. Yeah, and so you can learn from it too, just looking back at it. Yeah, right? so I think what I'm, what I'm trying to communicate is I, I think that really ties into what you've been talking about too, that with every, learn, with every one of these installations, you've learned something and uh, it almost takes hindsight for you to look back on it and go, oh, I see where I was then. Fair, yeah. And how far I've come. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that's, the, that's what I try to do. I try not to be self deprivating Mm -hmm. i try to look at it and go what can i do better and i don't always have the time to just 
woosa, you know, and, yeah, yeah, and yeah, think yeah. about those things. But I tried my best to, to think about them and then carry them forward. There have to be sometimes because what you're doing is very complicated and very hands on. And if it's client driven, it's um, time crunch. You're under time restriction. There has to be some of that older work where you look at it and you might respect it if you do look at it because you sometimes don't um, and think, oh, we, we really wanted to go this far, but we got it like that far. There, with all that machining and stuff that goes on, there must be some of those times. Yeah, yeah. totally. Yeah. Like we wanted sure. the shape to be such and such, but it ended up we got this far, right? Yeah. I mean, I don't, I'm trying to think about, I guess, really just materiality mm-hmm. or construction the way it was constructed we might go oh you know what if i could do that all over again i'd do it this way right. but it would be the thing is if i would do it that way it would be a completely different budget it'd be completely different materials right. and and so for the time and the place like generally i look back and i'm like this worked for the it time and the place that. and so i'm not too like self-critical about oh i could have done so much better if i did it this way it's like well no i did pretty good for what i had i guess and what you're working with and yeah like but that's not great anymore. Yeah. So let's aim higher now. That's all. So talking about different materials that you're working with in those struggles, then if you were to loop together a reel of like things breaking or, you know what I mean? The material not doing what it's supposed to do. What would that look like? Oh, I don't know. <laughs> I'm trying to think of times. Yeah. I mean, the only thing that we've really had that like broke, broke was, I mean, that concrete table. Mm-hmm. And then, um, one of four all ice creams carts broke mm-hmm. a couple times. And that was really fun because it was, of course, it was like emergency and I had to get there and they had a couple new events to do that week. I have bought many an ice cream I from know, the right? carts. I know, so yeah. good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> so good. I like, so many I, options. I like the idea of picturing the three of you working maybe, I don't know how often you're in the studio space together, but regardless, it's a dynamic and there's something happening there when you put three mm-hmm. artists in a studio together. But I picture you being like the most invasive, messy kind of one amongst it all. Is that the right <laughs> Um, yeah, that's a really, I think that's probably fair. You must take up the most space. I definitely take up the most yeah. space. Yeah. I mean, so so when I started Boko, nobody was with me. It was just me. Yeah. And so it was kind of like started as my workshop. And then Adam kind of came in to share it. And, and the way that we, yeah, his name's also I Adam. Like, yeah. Did I... Are you Sorry. talking about no, yourself? No, I'm not talking about myself in third person. <laughs> I was like, oh, okay, this it is getting the, real. I don't know if I've <laughs> even met another Adam before yeah. in my life. Oh, my god, I know they're out there. There's my two of them in the so same many studio. Adams, Are yeah. there? Oh, my God. Yeah, there's five in my grade, I think. <laughs> That's yeah. pretty oh. good. Anyway, um, he's, yeah, he's a year above me. but So we never even really met in high school. We went to the same high school, but we didn't meet. And um, anyway, so he joined in, and he's always been kind of sharing the space. So I was, you know, I've encouraged him to make a section of it his own and mm-hmm. to use everything because that's what he's supposed to be allowed access to. Mm-hmm. Um, so he does, but it's still very much like Boko space. And so that's why like everything's painted white. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I take some care and interest in where do the tools go and what makes sense for the dynamic of working on something. Yeah. And like, again, it goes back to him saying, you know, how do you find time for this? Or, you know, why do you care so much? Or, but that's like my design background as right. well coming in. Um, so yeah, when we're we're all, we're all in the studio, it kind of can be distracting, which is <laughs> fun, yeah. but it can be distracting. Watching sure. what other people are working on, and it's yeah. a cacophony yeah. of music and noise and <laughs> drilling, and yeah, I'm usually the music. Adam, where can everybody find you? So you can find us at boko.ca, mm-hmm. and on Instagram, you can find us at, at boko.ca, and out at the studio, and out at the studio. Yeah, yeah, please visit. We'd love We'd to love come to. visit. Yeah, we will. We're gonna take you up on that. Yeah, for sure. We'll 3D print something. Come with oh, ideas in mind. Fun. Yeah, I mean, it sometimes it takes 36 hours, but you can always come back and pick it up. <laughs> and uh, protective eyewear and uh, well, we've got all the we've before. got all the oh, okay. all the safety gear. You know, to worry awesome. about that. Yeah. yeah. Welding? Are we going to do some welding? I would love to do some welding. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> all right. Thanks so much for coming. You're yeah, welcome. Thank you. Thanks for having thanks, me. Adam. <laughs> Hey all, thanks for meeting us in Bond Park. Please like, rate, and subscribe to our podcast on the platform that you're listening to. And follow us on Instagram and Twitter at Bond Park Podcast. Original music by Alan Lung. <laughs>